The domain of healthcare generates large amounts of data driven by healthcare providers, hospitals, insurance, and regulatory and compliance requirements. We have Anirban Ghatak to show us how modern technologies and tools provide opportunities for actionable insights. Let us watch him as he spins different Databricks clusters and leverages the power of Apache Spark to perform data analysis. Now, what does it mean for healthcare organizations? How is the power of analytics married with strategic decision making? With smart science and technology and good business, can we see happier healthcare providers, healthier patients, improved physician patient relationships? We are privileged to have with us Ravi Ramaswamy to share his deepest insights using two use cases from healthcare, which would be followed by QA. Now, I would want to welcome Dr. Yogesh Bhatt, the Executive Vice President and Business Head of Stackroot, a veteran in the field of education and research. He brings with him 22 years of experience in corporate training. He has many product launches to his credit in the areas of information technology, data science, and management. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Bhatt. Over to you. Uh, thanks, Anirudh. Uh, welcome uh, all the participants to this uh, Stackroot webinar. Um, it's great that you are taking time off this, this fine afternoon to be with us. Uh, we all know that we are undergoing a difficult time today and we are all homebound in the safety of the home and that's the right place to be and that is the time where uh, we at stack Road, we believe that uh, we have an opportunity to learn as a learning provider it's our responsibility to bring out offerings direct to wherever you are and that's what we are doing today as uh, part of the webinar series and a few more things which we do Stack Root is a venture of NIIT. Uh, all of you know NIIT is a pioneer in, in IT training, uh, one of the very first and the largest. Uh, Stack Root was started as an incubation within NIIT in 2015 with a view that we can focus on a new uh, new areas of learning as well as new methods of learning. Uh, the very first program which was pioneered by Stackroot was the Stackroot Immersive Program, which is illustrated on the left side. We have trained uh, about 1,300 or more people under that program, which we believe creates world's of best full stack developers, product engineers. Uh, the next program we launched was Tech Root Remote, which again was focused first on full stack developer, uh, later on on adjacent skills such as uh, quality engineers, uh, more recently in service reliability engineers. Uh, we have done more than 4,000 people in that model, which goes to uh, reskilling a large IT uh, IT for uh, workforce in various companies. Uh, then we have uh, programs for mid-career professionals and of course we are really strengthening that part now. Uh, we are also having a uh, what we call a full stack developer quotient which is our assessment to measure how good a full stack developer one is. Uh, a large number of people are covered in that. We've been fortunate to work with some of the very marquee name in the industry uh some of them are shown here yeah let's move to the next one uh so this is what uh we offer this is what we stand for we offer programs like the pyramid uh right from uh, those for the fresh graduate hires uh to make full stack software engineers and full stack product engineers we also uh 
we offered programs for the mid level uh, can you go back in the last slide please uh, we also offer programs for the existing developers to make them full stack developers that's the remote program which i was talking about we have more point programs for example to make a technology versatilist to make a designer to make a software craftsman uh, so these are the uh, programs in our developer stack for mid career professionals we have programs such as architect program program managers product managers we have these variety of roles which we cover through an offering what we call as transformative programs with a view to transform the career of an individual and finally we have leadership level programs uh, around uh, digital transformation and associated areas while doing so we do cover an entire uh, range from cyber security to iot cloud blockchain data science rpa ai ml uh, today's webinar is a very relevant topic uh, data science is uh, correctly said as the profession of the future it's it's of course we have a large number of data scientists today but uh, from whatever we understand we have seen nothing of uh, that profession so far it will grow far more and, and uh, healthcare is obviously a very very key application area of data science so it's very relevant topic for you today uh, with that, uh, it is my pleasure to uh, welcome and introduce our experts who are the speakers today. Uh, let me uh, take this opportunity to uh, introduce Anirban Ghatak. Anirban Ghatak uh, is uh, a founder of a robotic edutech startup firm in Bengaluru. Uh, he has about 17 years experience in the areas of analytics and associated fields. Uh, and he is also an Azure data scientist and an expert in machine learning, big data and Azure. Uh, welcome Anirban, uh, thanks for joining us. Anirban is also a consultant uh, with Stackroot. Um, it, all, it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Ravi Ramaswamy here. Uh, I know Ravi Ramaswamy for, for quite a long time and have a great respect for him as a technology leader. Uh, he has more than three decades experience, uh, great experience, very long experience in this field. And he has, he is a part of the leadership team of Philips Innovation Campus at Bangalore. Uh, specifically, he heads a new business creation hub. Uh, I have been fortunate to have multiple interactions with Ravi where I have really greatly benefited from his vast experience and insights. And I'm sure uh, you will also benefit from the same in this uh, uh, webinar today. Uh, Ravi is very deeply involved in creating products and solutions for underserved segments that one of the things he directly leads and he is a fellow of institute of engineers india and hit lab usa he also chairs the healthcare track for iit in india so again welcome to anirban and, and to ravi uh, with this uh, let me hand it over to anirban to take it forward Thank you, uh, Dr. Bert, and um, good afternoon and good morning to all of you, uh, depending from where you are joining. And uh, my name is uh, Anirban Ghatak, and I'll be the first uh, speaker. And uh, let's start with something uh, interesting, something out of the box. And let's start with uh, uh, treasure hunting. You know, uh, there used to be a treasure hunting uh, TV series that became quite uh, popular, in which uh, there were 14 treasures which were given uh, in the open world for them to decipher and find out the treasure and it is quite an interesting event and a series in the tv called as the secret a treasure hunt and till date only three treasures out of 14 yeah. have been found all right and why do i start uh, with uh, treasure hunting uh, the, on this particular webinar because today all of us who are you know in data science data engineering data architecture data modeling all of us are like enterprise treasure hunters because uh, we are trying to find uh, more value out of our data and uh, 
the value which we uh, find out for our end business are actually the treasures and since our topic uh, for today um, is based on data breaks this is an interesting faq uh, from the data breaks website and how beautifully uh, the data breaks um, community also is comparing the current journey of um, uh, the data community as the enterprise uh, treasure hunters so i welcome all of the enterprise treasure hunters um, in this uh, webinar today the next uh, slide um, we are talking about uh, the big data timeline obviously uh, this is not um, uh, the total uh, landscape that has happened in the last uh, 15 years but since this is a wide forum depending on the number of years of experience you might have seen some or all of this technology and I'm, I'm totally sure that all of you have heard about all this technology. So the big data paradigm started somewhere circa in 2005 with the Hadoop with the map uh, reduce algorithm, which was essentially a file based model for um, uh, handling big data. Then a, a group of innovative scientists and computer, uh, com computer scientists uh, from UC Berkeley they came with a model which was faster than map reduced it was rdds and they made uh, apache spark uh, and then apache spark um, came out to be more fast because of their concept of in memory computing uh, than uh, traditional dicks and then we had uh, the concept of um, uh, data lake which actually interestingly started from a blog and um, people uh, started implementing enterprise uh, data lake and you know using uh, using uh, their data from uh, from uh, from their database data warehouse and keeping it into their data lake uh, for a future uh, projects when they they find out the right questions what they eventually do with this uh, data the same team of apache spark somewhere in 2013 they came out um, with a uh, uh, with a platform around uh, spark um, and they called it databricks uh, bear in mind databricks is both a product as well as a company and now we have uh, something called as uh, Delta Lake, which is an open source storage layer that runs over your traditional uh, raw data lake. And this is as uh, fresh as uh, 2019. Now, what is interesting is that in, in this enterprise big data ecosystem, um, everything is still in use, which means you, you just cannot uh, say that, you know, since we have data bricks and Delta Lake, um, yeah, we will not use Hadoop. You know, SDFS is still much, very much in business. So that makes it very interesting as well as challenging for the treasure hunters, ACA, the data community to use, you know, which stacks uh, when. So coming forward that, you know, I would like to ask a poll question that, you know, being a treasure hunter, being a data, data, data person, all of you, what are the top challenges uh, that you are finding in, uh, you, in your enterprise data uh, work. So this is an audience poll because uh, let's uh, try to be a little bit interactive. We have two polls and I'll give you 10 to 15 minutes uh, to answer this question before I go to the next slide. So please, you would be, you'll be finding a poll question in your screen now and I'll stop for the next seven to eight seconds and come back with the poll results. Please poll. So I have submitted my results and uh, let's wait um, uh, for the results to come in. And thank you so much for participating. I think uh, majority of the audience feels that, you know, data set creation, data labeling from database, uh, ETL and legacy, uh, yeah, can't agree more. And um, the next highest is that, you know, uh, you are saying that you are not uh, involved in a data initiative. That's perfectly fine. All of us are learning at some point of time. But what is more important that all of you love to be in this in initiative? That's lovely. I think we, we have a brilliant uh, audience uh, in this webinar. Now pat on the back. Okay, let's proceed. And this is more or less. I am also talking that you know you know what about um, what about you know getting my models. You know there is something like doing. Um, a regression or doing a um, you know visualization on a laptop or doing it in a small server but how, taking it on a production scale which is being used in the production process is complicated it's, it is not that that we do not have a process now we do have process but we all know that the process from taking it from development to production where our customers can actually use it as a business as usual 
uh, process is really complex and that is what um, I am trying to say that you know the production process is complex and then if you look at um, an enterprise asset today you know people who are belonging to infrastructure in this uh, organize in this webinar you know um, touch base a medium level or a high level program in which we work and if you're working on a physical data model your physical data model across an enterprise is a complicated network as you see below like a metro train station and you do, do not know where it starts and where it ends you know data modelers uh, often ask and that's the number one option in the poll also that you know where is my source data because i don't know where my data is taking birth now this has become a complicated enterprise you know mash and a challenge and secondly the expectation is that we'll have an end-to-end -end pipeline as you can see from a beautiful illustration from azure from microsoft that we need the customer and our uh, modern digital initiative needs us to create end-to-end -end pipeline starting from data ingestion from various business units various local uh, lo uh, localization of our business uh, from uh, from again un untraditional sources like sensors iot devices social media streaming and then you know doing our uh, storing uh, preparation and data engineering of our data and then you know finally taking it uh, to our analytics dashboard so the end-to-end -end pipeline um, is the demand but where do we have the end-to-end -end environment because you know you, we end up having so many tools to do it and then stitching through these tools can be a really bottleneck you know really problem for all the uh, treasure hunters finally the collaboration you know the collaborations between uh, the business the architecture community um, the engineering community the devops community can we have a one platform in which we integrate all of them can we all work together on the same uh, environment and these are the challenges i think which i personally have always faced in data science data engineering uh, a project and here comes uh, data bricks uh, to the rescue and data bricks uh, they they, uh, they rightfully project themselves as a unified analytics platform because all the problems that i was um, talking in the previous slide slide is beautifully mitigated if not totally avoided by uh, this unified analytics platform which you can see on the left because they have a scalable infrastructure and a devops platform which is on at the bottom of the unified analytics which is databricks you can ingest your data from multiple data sources you know it can be a local data source it can be a data lake it can be an oracle server it can be an etl data warehouse then you can write your data processing um, uh, code in your in python or in java um, according to your development standards and eventually you can um, uh, create pipelines which means if example if you're using azure within databricks you can use azure data factory to integrate your data bricks um, uh, with data factory and hence um, deliver a pipeline so essentially what this unified analytics platform from data bricks gives you um, is uh, that you take the data uh, which is there in your enterprise the clue to your treasure hunting and then you culminate it into an opportunity as you can see and how with an orchestration of the various teams like your business your sponsor your product owner your business analyst your data engineering team your data modeling team the data scientist and overall an architect integrating it overall over the cloud so see how beautifully the challenges are getting um, uh, getting mitigated in this unified uh, analytics uh, skill now let's see um, one use case because essentially we are talking about healthcare also and you know how how do we how we can apply this on a healthcare kind of a uh, setup now um, i understand uh, from the audience that uh, is not that all of you belong to the healthcare domain which is perfectly all right so i will start with something which is um, very simple uh, to understand but yet very important and it's called the operating uh, room um, uh, efficiency now uh, especially uh, in india and folks who are in india uh, we generally called it, it as an operation theater not as an operation room uh, it's partly uh, partly not on the right side because you know operation theater as you can see on the diagram and the painting from your left from the agnew cl clinic that ot is a very old concept it is still there in medical colleges which essentially means that the senior doctor who is a professor is is doing the um, is taking class on anatomy um, over a body and the students uh, see uh, the the professor perform 
uh, the medical steps. Okay, so that's why it is a theater. There, you know, the professor is acting as the lead actor, and there is an audience. So, but you know, operation theater or are both same things, and it is also the most profitable um, one of the most profitable um, units uh, for uh, for an hospital uh, business for the hospital hospital industry. So managing it both from a cost uh, perspective and also from a profit uh, perspective is very important uh, for the healthcare industry, and it is not so uh, not so easy um, to do it. The reason being that there are too many variables that comes in when you are dealing with OR. Now, if you look at the cornerstones for managing uh, an OR, you can have many things like you know the cost of supply, uh, equipment problem. If if you are putting some equipment like a ventilator in the OR and um, uh, if it uh, stops working, you incur a cost which is unplanned. Hence, um, your margins um, uh, takes a hit. You know there is a blocking time. How much time before the operation you need to block? Because you probably you need a blocking time. To do a heart surgery, you might not need a blocking uh, time to do a kneecap replacement surgery. You need to also do a triage, like you know somebody is dry, dying, and then you need to attend that patient. And whereas compared to something which is not so life-threatening, the turnaround time and obviously the support between the physician. I mean, uh, you need to collaborate uh, uh, the uh, labor charges from uh, from high-end physician like a neurosurgeon. So you need to calculate all this cost. So this becomes a classical um, uh, classical use case, and also for investment for problems which uh, can be solved using using regression to predict some uh, value using supervised learning, or also you can use uh, you know your classical operation management optimization problem that you know how do I optimize uh, the hours which are there in the um, um, of OR so that you know I do not have. An idle time. So this kind of use cases, you can really uh, come up uh, if you have a competency or if you have a healthcare practice in your organization, or if you're doing it alone, you can actually look for OR um, effectiveness. And this kind of modeling uh, can be done also using uh, data breaks. So as we say, uh, let's go to our next uh, poll questions. And uh, again, as usual, I would encourage all of you to participate uh, in this poll question because uh, it is linked to a surprise which I'll be telling at the end uh, as I exit. Uh, so I'll give you seven more seconds to do this poll. Okay, so let's see if we have uh, the results. Yes, so the results are here. Um, do you think data lake is relevant? Oh, so 66% of you think um, data uh, data lake uh, is uh, relevant uh, to your industry and business. 33% uh, percent, um, uh, you are saying no. And what is what is incredible and fascinating is none of you say no, which is which is which is spot on. And uh, I'll keep my promise because. Um, uh, the poll has supported me, so I'll, I'll come up with a surprise as I conclude. Now let's move on. Now, uh, Databricks, you know, apart from being an inu uh, unified analytics platform, it is actually Apache Spark under under the under the hood. And now, um, Databricks is available both on the Azure Cloud platform and the AWS platform. And as I said, that you know, Spark uh, Spark uh, came up uh, from a concept called as RDD. Which was better than a map reduce and it is in memory. But you know, when you are taking one step above and taking Databricks into an AWS cloud or an Azure cloud, you get a lot of uh, other additional benefit than a standalone Apache Spark uh, installation. Uh, so, what does you get? You can run multiple Spark version if you are taking Databricks. Uh, that was not possible with a standalone installation of Spark. As such, installation of Spark uh, is always painful. I mean, if you are if you are an administrator. In this webinar, or if you have done some kind of uh, Spark installation for your project and proof of concept, you you get what where I'm coming from. Okay, you can also use um, a built-in cloud um, storage components like the Blob or the AWS S3, and in, uh, such integration on a standalone Apache Spark is not possible. There are other factors like you know auto auto caching, multiple uh, users sharing a cluster, integration with tableaus and other uh, tools. We'll see this uh, tools and integration as we go to the demo shortly. Workflow, job alerts, and obviously the most important point is that you also get the expert support and the enterprise security because security becoming so much uh, critical. Uh, and if you are moving on, on the Azure Cloud example, you have 
a security which is uh, enterprise grade SLA and security is backed up by uh, Microsoft. All right. Now, um, before we go to the demo, um, I would like to conclude by saying that it's a truly an unified uh, stack because here are the top 10 mantras and this is like a racing car, you know, uh, doing your F1 race off your treasure hunt in the enterprise and taking you as a winner because you because you are using essentially Apache Spark under the hood in, in Databricks and those of you have done um, Apache Spark and are aware how RDDs work, you know, there is a concept of data lineage and which is maintained. Uh, you have a more firm uh, grip over data quality. You have multiple jobs which you can run at the same time. It's capped currently at a thousand jobs per hour. Um, if you are into deep learning and you know video and pictures, you must be using GPU. And um, so uh, Databricks gives you both CPU and GPU instances, and um, you can uh, you can use it as per your need and budget in your projects. End-to-end -end pipeline. I already gave the example of using Azure Data Factory version two. Uh, there is a collaborative workspace, so which I'll be showing in the demo, which means that all your business, your data engineering, and your product managers, product owners, they can work together in the same workspace. Uh, frameworks like uh, TensorFlow from Google, XGBoost, MLflow, they are all uh, supported. Uh, file format of Big Data Park Queue is supported. Uh, HDFS, Kafka, those are also supported. They are scalable. You know, there are auto terminate and auto scaling features. Enterprise security because um, you are taking it over the cloud, so you have a, um, a healthcare security coming in like the HIPA. You have access token generation. You also have uh, GDPR compliance. And note that you know it's a pass offering from both at AWS um, and Azure. So um, let's go to the demo because we have talked and we have talked about unified analytics in the ten mantra uh, of uh, data breaks. Now here we'll do a demo and. Uh, uh, if you are new to um, healthcare, I would recommend you to start your data engineering um, uh, with this particular data set. It is uh, the NHA MCS, which is the National Hospital Ambulatory Medical Care Survey. It's a public data set and it is based on survey-based data. The file is, um, uh, is complex. It's not an easy data set to start, but that's what we want in our uh, skilling process or in our POC when you're trying to get uh, move into healthcare because it has more than uh, 500 uh, columns and uh, it is uh, available to download and you can you can use it um, uh, really um, easily in your um, in your projects of data science using data breaks. So let's um, move into um, our demo section now. You might uh, see a blickering of your screen. All right, so I'll just um, uh, change to my So uh, hopefully all of you can um, see my screen now. I'm logged into Azure and um, to uh, create a Databricks screen, uh, the, you can simply create a, and log in into uh, Databricks. Uh, Databricks also gives you uh, a free uh, cluster without using cloud, but it is capped at uh, 2 GB and it gives you single instance. It's, it's not too much of use. Um, of use in in, uh, in uh, enterprise project. So all you have to do is give your instance name, and you it gives you three in, instance of pricing. And if you are starting new, you can start with a 40 days trial. And I I will be using this trial version. All right. So um. So here um I am in the screen, and uh, my uh, uh, my cluster uh, is there. Just to make sure that you know uh, you are seeing the right screen, I'll do it again. All right. So as you can see, uh, mm, uh, I have logged in. I've created the instance because it's a uh, webinar, and I'll just quickly take you uh, to the main components before going to that uh, NHAMCS uh, data set. And uh, this is your overview page after you have spun the cluster. The first thing you need to do. Uh, take care is uh, creating a cluster because essentially it is uh, spark uh, under the hood so you can see that you know it gives you a flavor of uh, the runtime versions of spark which you need including the gpu versions as you can see so you have wide variety of options using your spark and uh, the scala version which you need to do and as i said that it it, it has the feature of um, uh, 
uh, auto scaling there is also a, a timeout feature excellent for you know project use because we generally i always cap it at 30 minutes so that you know when i go for coffee break or something and if i forget to stop my cluster i don't incur a cost over my project and my organization you can also uh, set up um, the minimum and the maximum workers which you need uh, for your cluster if, if example for small jobs you don't need so many workers and as you can see that you know it gives you a lot of options in terms of um, uh, the server types including um, uh, your gpu uh, clusters all right so i'll not be creating uh, the cluster because i have um, already created the cluster and um, i can start it on all right so that's the first um, part of it you also have um, a concept known as um, uh, your dbfs which is an option to upload any local files for your proof of concept up to 2 GB. So all you need to do that is that you can just select the path and uh, and uh, pop in uh, a file which you which you want to use, and the file gets um, uh, uploaded um, uh, into your uh, uh, in, into your local file system within uh, Databricks. Um, so this is as you can see that here I I have. Um, uh, I have some imported the demo which I will be using the file is already imported but for live uh, uh, pipeline you also have uh, options of integrating with the uh, blobs uh, which are um, Azure or file system uh, you also have data lake store Cassandra JDBC drivers Kafka Redis Elasticsearch so you there is a whole uh, lot of um, uh, lot of options uh, to ingest your data and there are also automated code which means that you know if i want to integrate with blob i can just uh, create uh, click on it and it will automatically pop up uh, the code uh, as a template for me to read the data which is which is wonderful because i don't have to go and refer the api again and see because everything is given all i need to do is change these parameters and run it and it's uh, ready to run um, apart from data and clusters, which have I already shown you, you have the options to create uh, jobs, and these jobs can uh, call the notebooks at uh, runtime, and you can also um, do some uh, automation in using this uh, job. There is an also option of uh, um, uh, calling uh, the access token because you, if you have to generate security and API tokens, you can generate tokens uh, from this. So as I said, it's more or less a very concrete unified platform. Uh, you can also do a lot of collaboration like add users, like currently I just have myself, but if I want, I can add uh, maybe five of you from uh, this webinar using your email ID, provided we are in the same uh, corporate domain and your Azure Active Directory and all are set up. And we can all collaborate using our email and uh, you can share the same uh, environment, all right? Now, um, let's go uh, to that particular um, uh, uh, case. And you can see that, you know, uh, I have uh, uploaded uh, the file into it. Um, I'll not be running it. I've already run it because it's a webinar and uh, these are powerful systems. So it, it takes like 15, 20 minutes to boot. As you see, it, it is booting. But it does not matter. I've already run it from you. You can see that you know it's the same environment as you as you see in your uh, local Jupyter notebooks. Just you have to take care of certain small changes, uh, like you know uh, the APIs changes a little bit for the pandas uh, uh, in uh, Databricks. Like you do not put a header true and all those things when you're using it at Databricks. And you can see that you know it gives you the same feeling um, as you have with uh, um, uh, notebooks, and you can collaborate over it. You can integrate over it with uh, runtime, and um, you can you can really have a good uh, unified analytics platform when you are uh, doing your analytics project, be it in healthcare or um, any other domain. All right. So this data set coming back, as I said, that it's a survey-based uh, data set. Uh, I'll not be going into the details in the webinar slide. Um, the, the data set and the codes are given. So what I'm trying to do in this demo is that you know I'm first ingesting the file, and as you can see that you know it has uh, over uh, 6,000 records and 154 columns in this particular data set, and it shows approximately the survey results of you know kidney dialysis um, kind of uh, uh, clinics uh, in the um, uh, in a particular uh, location and what i'm doing is that i am doing some initial data analysis and telling okay what are my columns and how many which state has the highest number of uh, clinics like you know doing a group by state you know simple uh, exploratory data analysis 
and you know and trying to f find out some more value out of this data sorting them according to the states and you know doing a simple um, uh, observation that california as a state has the highest number of dialysis center as you can see california has 625 and then um, I'm also trying to see that which uh, clinic uh, is the best because there is a column which I found out that it's called total performance score. And um, I, I, when I when I run some simple uh, queries, I see that you know uh, it is a string, so I convert it into an integer. The normal you know uh, data preparation things which we do in our job day in and day in, uh, day out as data engineers. And then you know we find out that you know uh, both uh, Idaho and Wyoming are the best uh, performing uh, states in terms of uh, dialysis center. And then, you know, you can be a treasure hunter and you can go ahead saying that, you know, both are a mountain uh, based area. So does altitude have, an, uh, have a role to play with, which is a better uh, kidney um, uh, analysis kind of a center or a renal clinic does altitude, which means that if you're at higher altitude, will your feedback be generally high in terms of uh, renal clinic yeah, it's abstract but you know you can find out some kind of patterns into it and do it have, have a pattern okay so this is these are the simple analysis um, which i have done and if you have used uh, jupyter notebook i'm pretty sure that you know uh, you have you have got the flavor that you know um, it is um, the look and feel uh, and jupyter notebook but it's much uh, better all right so um, let's go back uh, to the slides So we have we've done this basic demo and as i said that you know i i did not this is a small webinar of 40 minutes so i'm i did spin off any regression models into it but um just to give you an introductory factor um uh, that you know how um, healthcare data sets can play into data bricks um you will have uh, the link um uh, now um, i would uh, invite um, uh, ravi uh, uh, to uh, to come and share his experience on the use cases. So over to you, uh, Ravi. Yeah, uh, thank you, Anirban. Thanks for sort of putting this out together in terms of what are the technologies and what do we as data scientist engineers get to see there. What I really want to do is to talk a few minutes about how the technology that you heard from Anirban is actually going to be put to use so that at the end of the day, me and you and the patients can see an impact of it. Because at the end of the day, the technology is only a means to an end. And here, the end for us is to hit the quadruple aim, which talks about how do I enhance uh, patient outcomes? How do I drive down the cost of care? How do I enhance the patient experience as also the caregiver experience? So basically what I wanted to do here is to look at two areas uh, two applications which will which can be developed using ai ml and the and uh, the latest of uh, technologies and see what is the impact that it actually has on ground to a doctor and to a patient let me start with the automated lung screening the problem statement given to us uh, was saying hey i screen two and a half thousand patients every day this was basically a country in the Middle East. Let me step back a bit. This was in Qatar, where they said that we have got immigrant workers who need to be screened for TB once in two years. And every day, the doctor has to look at something like two and a half to 3,000 images, which, uh, which can be very, very exhausting and tiring. And at the same time, it also has the propensity of uh, miss-outs in the sense that the doctor might not be able to actually detect uh, something that is out there uh, given the stack because in any of these the uh, anomalies account for about 10 percent the balance 90 percent are normal uh, x-ray uh, screens x-ray images so what we did was uh, in pic what we did was we said we will develop an algorithm which basically looks for lesions and then throws out those to the doctor in a separate list uh, as as an s or no so we we got the data sets we got about a million data sets and we wrote this and the algorithm was written and actually tested out so what it basically does is when you run the algorithm over a stack of images it basically tells you saying is this a normal image or is there a 
challenge there? Is it normal or non-normal? And then if it is a non-normal, it also tries and tells you what are the areas that you need to look for. Basically segments it. So in this way, you're hitting actually two points in the sense for one, you are trying to help the radiologist in pointing out a lesion which otherwise he could have missed. And number two, you're also increasing the productivity because now what the radiologist does is he comes in, he opens his work list and he finds that out of the top 100 cases is something that needs his attention. The balance 2400 does not need his attention. These are normal images. So he goes through the first hundred, spends the time on what is needed to make, make a do a good job there. And then for the balance hundred, he's able to do it much faster. So in this sense, you are trying to optimize on both ends. You are trying to uh, ensure that the lesions, if any, get picked up, which otherwise has a probability of getting mixed of uh, missed up. And also you try to ensure that you are saving on the time. So the customer came back and told us saying that using this algorithm, where he has been able to improve the productivity by about 30%. And I can tell you with a fair degree of confidence that radiologists are one of the most expensive species uh, in the medical fraternity. So any saving, a 30% saving there means a lot in terms of dollars or euros to the hospital per se. That is one. The second thing what I wanted to touch on was a mother and child care case. This is something where we said we will come up with uh, the problem statement here is, if I take a country like Indonesia or any of the underserved economies, you find that the maternal mortality and the neonatal mortality are at an all time high. They are about 15 to 20 times what you get to see in the developed world. Just to put a perspective to this, in Japan, for every 100,000 babies, you lose 18 babies. And in Indonesia, you lose 253 babies. So in that sort of a situation, the problem statement was, how can we come up with a support system uh, where we are able to track mother and child and ensure that they are uh, that the delivery uh, goes through in a safe manner. And also uh, another point to be noted is the regional spread of Indonesia. It starts all the way from near the Andaman Nicobar Islands and it goes right beyond Japan. Uh, not many of you would have known this, but then uh, the, uh, from one point to the other, it's a six and a half hour flight uh, that, uh, that one has to take. It's that long. So given the disparateness and the wilderness that you encounter in these underserved segments, we need to come up with a system by which we are able to improve the maternal and neonatal uh, health. So what we did was we came up with what is called as a mobile obstetrics monitoring. Uh, here, what you do is you've got a caregiver uh, attached to a primary care center in Indonesia. In a, we did it in a place called Padang. And this caregiver would go to the house of the woman, the uh, moment she gets information that the lady has conceived and starts monitoring some of her basic parameters. The parameters could be uh, something like her weight, uh, would be her hemoglobin, would be the glucose levels, would be her iron content, and, and a set of about 10 or 15 parameters that get measured. All this gets entered into an application. And then the... Uh, she requests the woman to come to the primary care center for an ultrasound scan. It is mandated that you need to do three scans in each of the trimesters to ensure that the baby is doing well and progressing well. Now, all this is, is captured and it is uploaded into a central server. And there you have AI and ML and what we call it as clinical decision support systems that run which basically looks at all these parameters, the trends over a period of time. And then the, when the gynec actually looks at these reports, it also uh, brings in a certain sort of a risk scoring mechanism into it, which is called as a Fuji, uh, Fuji scoring in the Indonesian market. It's a standard out there. So we use this algorithm. And of course, this algorithm gets improved as it sees more and more cases. So based on these, 
you stratify the woman saying is it going to be a complex or is it going to be a traumatic one or is it going to be a normal delivery which can be done either in the house or with the uh, uh, with a qualified uh, uh, maid attendant out there so based on this uh, these sort of algorithms then help the doctor to take a decision and then communicate to the far end. Now, distance does not become a barrier because you are now connected. We have tied up with Telecom Indonesia to sort of actually get the reach in terms of uh, ensuring people have connectivity and they're able to log into the network at appropriate times. So by doing so, you work with an ecosystem and you also you have the AIML tools which help you build these sort of uh, decision support systems by which the caregiver at the far end is now able to seek an advice from the doctor and provide an appropriate level of care as is needed. To cut the chase, uh, we found that we managed about 980 women uh, in a period of one year. And, uh, and I'm proud to say that we were able to reduce the maternal mortality and the neonatal mortality to zero. There was not a single case which had to be where we lost a life. So uh, the fact remains that these tools can have far reaching consequences if it is deployed the right way. And uh, as we saw, technology when it is actually put to use and when you can see the results impacting the caregiver and the patient and uh, touching people's life and making a positive impact, that's when you know that the technology has achieved the, uh, the, the goals that it was set out for. Uh, I, I think I would possibly want to end there and give you all uh, 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 some time for asking questions and answers if any. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ravi. Uh, it was very uh, insightful and very helpful. Um, so can we have uh, the questions now, please? Hi, Nirban. Nirban, you would, uh, if you can open your chat window, you'll be able to see the questions. We have questions from Manish Verma, Suresh, and Himanshu. So um, uh, before I go to the Q&A, um, I would like to invite all of you and based on the poll of feedback also that, you know, um, I would uh, like to uh, invite you uh, for um, the next um, um, uh, webinar, which is there on uh, 30th, uh, because it is on uh, Data Lake. So if you uh, follow the um, uh, page on LinkedIn from Stackroot, you will you'll see the posters and the feedback, um, uh, the banners coming on uh, for the next webinar, which is on uh, 30th. Yeah. So I'll go uh, to the Q&A. Uh, so for Manish Verma has a question that, you know, um, for ATGV uh, configuration of uh, cluster, uh, what is the configuration of the cluster? So ATGV is just the storage parameter and with the big data, it's actually not uh, a very big size. But definitely, um, you cannot go with a local uh, Databricks uh, file system because that has a cap of um, 2 GB in it. So um, uh, you, you have to configure, um, uh, if you're using Blob, I would recommend that you start um, uh, with a Blob storage or a collection of Blob storage um, uh, to, um, uh, to start with your cluster for 80 GB, all right? Uh, you can also use database if you have uh, structured data. So ATGV is not a problem. The only caveat is um, you cannot use the DBFS because that is for small experiment and 2GB is the limit. Uh, can we have the PPT and recording of this uh, call? Uh, Anirudh, can you answer that? Uh, the recording yes. of this? Uh, yes, the recording will be shared with everyone who's attended as well. So I think when you have registered, you have done it with your email and the registration um, uh, will come in uh, and the videos, all right. Um, Pandas is disturbed. I think uh, Manish, you mean that the screen was not there for some time? Yes, because uh, that's the latency that comes in with such live webinars because I'm moving between PowerPoint uh, to the screen. Uh, but yes, I did use Pandas uh, data frame, but uh, if you're using Pandas data framing um, in Databricks, Make sure you read the Databricks API. Like I said, that certain factors like uh, header is equal to true, those things don't work and gives you syntax error. So 
it's more of a syntax uh, syntaxing issue and i'm sure that if you uh, if you if you are in programming for some times it should not it should be a cake work all right and the documentation of the apis for databricks uh, is very good all right can we do data cl cleansing the next question uh, from himanshu for sure in fact that is mandatory because garbage in garbage out and that is where 80 percent 70 to 80 percent of the time is actually spent not on uh, modeling uh, so that is more um, you know uh, people don't realize but i think according to me if you ask me uh, data engineering and the data cleansing part of it uh, uh, and data labeling is the most important part and then comes your modeling and you know doing those you know high uh, high concept stuff like you know example if you're doing your neural networks and if your data itself is not cleaned what will your neural network do so yeah we can do data cleaning with it you can do advanced data cleaning uh, with uh, data bricks so the registration link is um, also given for the next webinar um, on 30th and i think when the slide would be given uh, we can add uh, the registration link for the next one i have another question from suresh Oh, that's a good question actually. Um, why, how, why Databricks um, is popular com uh, compared to uh, HD Insight? Now, HD Insight, one uh, difference is that you know it is used for a 24 bar 7 kind of a production load. So if you if you have to use use um, huge um, uh, huge scale of data where there is you know large volume of um, data coming in. So in that case, um, uh, you you can use HD Insight because um, when you're using data breaks, it is more for collaboration between your business, your data engineer, and your data scientist. And um, uh, and you, you are limited to the number of jobs. So you know, high petabytes kind of uh, production um, uh, load, I think I would recommend uh, HD, um, uh, HD Insight. Yeah. So that's a very good question by uh, Suresh. Uh, how can we integrate? You know what, Suresh? Um, I actually have a slide in it. When and when I send it out, I'll add a slide in the backup section. Uh, I was looking if I had it, but I have it somewhere. But I'll add it before it is released to all of you. Uh, the difference between HD Insight and Databricks. When to use what? I think that's a brilliant question. Salesforce um, by default, Salesforce connector is uh, not here. I'll show you what are the third party because. Um, uh, it's, uh, integration which are uh, available so if you just bear with me with a minute so i'll show you what is available upfront in terms of third party uh, integration i'll just uh, share my screen again and um, if you uh, go to partner integration here you can see that the integration is given by um, uh, click. Uh, you know, click is very um, uh, predominant. Click and cycle of both. Uh, so you have these things, and uh, click is very commonly used. Fivetran, Infowork, Streamset, uh, Singsort. So these are um, uh, applicable upfront. You can also speak with your um, account manager uh, from AWS or Microsoft and see that you know where do you actually stand. Um, uh, in in terms of you know um, uh, in terms of uh, your integration with uh, Salesforce. So I'll move on. For 80 GB, I think um, 80 GB storage uh, is not a problem, uh, Manish. You can in, uh, you can all use S3. You can use Blob. If you're using a Databricks on AWS, you can uh, use uh, S3. If you're using Azure, you can use um, uh, Blobs and uh, configure them. You can also, you, if you have data lake, you can also integrate data lakes um, uh, with um, uh, with um, uh, with your Databricks. What you need to decide apart from storage is, you know. What is the compute power you need? You know, what is the CPU power and the GPU power that you need? So those things will also has to be considered, uh, considered, all right? Thus, uh, Databricks interoperate with uh, other uh, Apache distribution, other products of um, uh, Apache Spark. Not all of them, uh, but uh, most of them actually. So in the next webinars, if you come, we'll be talking with another Apache product 
um, uh, which is uh, Delta Bricks. Uh, it, it got into Apache and that is supported. Um, then other stuff which I already so told, things like Kafka and all are uh, supported. So if you're not talking about CPU Manish, um, you can, um, if you're talking about um, the CPU power, if not the storage, it, it is given. So if you if you go and try to create the instance, um, uh, the uh, the instance sizes, there is a sizing guide that, that is available. And if you just Google, um, um, you know, uh, the sizing guide from Databricks, you can see, you know, what are the worker nodes and what are the master node combinations um, uh, you can have, okay? Anirudh, I think uh, that's more or less. Um, do you want to conclude when they're going to get the slide and the registration link in the last three, four minutes now? Yeah, so th thanks a lot, firstly. So I want to thank thank you very much, Anirban, for showing us that the advanced analytical approach are only to help us move from complexity to simplicity. It was a new learning for most of us as you worked with such large data set. Also, Ravi, sir, we at Stackroot are deeply honored with your presence here. As you said, technology is only the means to end. And thank you so much for sharing your insights through the use cases. Thanks again, Anirban and Ravi, sir. So uh, if Anirban, one request I would have here is if we have someone who would want to ask questions at this point of time, we would uh, request them to stay back and we can spend some five minutes or so then we can answer their questions as well. Okay. Sure. Sounds good. Yeah. And also the feedback form link will also be available in the uh, chat window. Would request people to just fill the feedback form for two minutes. Yeah, I think Manish, you are not clear on uh, the options of the cluster configuration. What I'll do is that I'll insert uh, the actual link um uh, where you can read and find out what are the options which are given in terms of cluster configuration so you have a lot of options uh, uh, for cluster configuration and i showed very briefly you know there was a drop down list uh, of you know having my master and uh, my um, uh, worker nodes but i'll put a link on the reference slide so no worries there yeah 